there are all sorts of ways of creating really interesting textures and marks in watercolour without using your brush. And I've made films over the past couple of months about using salt, using plastic wrap, splattering, um, sanding with watercolour pencil. And it's very easy to forget about them as soon as you've seen the film or use them once and you kind of forget about them. So I always suggest to students that they create a bit of a crib sheet like that. But carrying around sheets is really not that convenient. And then on Friday, today's Sunday, on Friday, a student said to me, I did exactly what you said, but I've turned it in to a little book full of samples. And I was like, that is genius and she said I carry it around and it reminds me all the time. So well done Jill and I want to share her idea with you today. Also 22 different ways of adding textures to your watercolour. My name's Liz Chatterton, I'm a watercolour artist based in Berkshire and every week I bring you a tip, trick or technique I wish I'd known ages ago and this week it's those 22 different methods, but it's also how to put them together into a lovely little concertina book you can carry around with you. Making a little sketchbook or journal from a single piece of paper is really straightforward. Now I've got a quarter of a sheet of watercolour paper here. If you used a whole sheet, you could make a really nice big sketchbook for taking out and about or a journal. So first thing you have to do is fold it in half. Do you want to try and get your folds as smooth and sharp as possible? If you happen to have, this is called a bone folder, that's great. If not, the handle of a knife or just running your fingernail along there and you can actually turn it back on itself a few times just to make sharp folds is fine. Then you need to fold the edges in. Now this is £140 and you can see it's quite tricky to fold. And we'll do that there. So you're putting the corners into that centre fold and folding your sheet in four. Okay, now fold it, open it out and then fold it in half the other way. Do exactly the same. So take the edges into the middle. Obviously if you're doing it with a full sheet of watercolour paper you'd need a bigger working space and it might be a bit like grappling a, an octopus. You could even do it with a double elephant size piece of paper to make a really big sketchbook. You can do what you like really. So after you've folded it into four each way you will have 16 spaces and then we need to cut it. And I'm going to just use a knife to slit it. You could use a sharp knife, you could use a pair of scissors. So we're going to cut three out of the four Can you see I've just cut those three out of the four and I'm going to do exactly the same here. So I've cut there. Now I need to turn it round and on the central one I'm going to cut again three out of those four. So effectively, can you see, I've got a long zigzag of paper. Just, <laughs> Do you see what I mean? It's a bit like wrestling an octopus. So now we need to start folding and we just concertina it back on itself like that. When we get to the edge we can just fold it under and then 
fold it, fold it, fold it over, fold it backwards, forwards, fold it over, backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. And you will end up with a pile like this. So basically a long strip of paper that has been folded into a little book. Now, what you will notice as you open it is that you've obviously got some double edges like that. Some will have an opening at the top and some, I've lost one, will have an opening at the bottom. So if you were using this, you could either have those as sort of a double spread or you can stick them together to form a little pocket for storing things. We've got our basic book and you might just want to, you know, weight it down under something heavy to get those folds a bit sharper. If we want to make this, I say, a little bit more sophisticated, what we can do is do something with these double bits and we can turn them into little pockets to store things in. So if you cut out a a little V like this and get some glue. You could use a glue stick, you could use whatever you want. I've got some glue here, white glue. We can stick down the sides and form a little pocket. So that will need to dry. Let's keep going. Now this double one is facing downwards, so it's probably not sensible to use that as a pocket. You could use that as a sort of double page spread. Keep going. And I've got another double there. So I think we'll have two pockets in this one. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So if you cut a bit of mount board that is slightly bigger, we could put a front and a back cover on it and that would just give it a little bit more sort of rigidity, make it a little bit tougher. If you want to be able to keep it closed so that it doesn't all ping out, the other thing you can do is find a bit of ribbon or cord and use this to keep it closed. So I've found the middle of my ribbon which is about there and the middle of my cover is about there and what I'm going to do is stick that in place sort of here Now what I'm going to do is find a bit of paper just to protect my work. You see these are my notes. <laughs> um, and you just put it inside the first fold so that if I overlap like that, I'm not going to get any glue on the next pages. So be quite generous with this because you want it to stick and make sure you go right to the edges because you've got that paper there to, to protect you, or not protect you, protect the, the paper. And then we can just put our cover in place, centre it, make sure it's even. You've cut it just a few millimetres bigger, press it down and that is our back cover. Then we will need to do exactly the same at the front. And then my little bit of mount board that I've cut to be slightly bigger, I pop in place. Let's remove that and get rid of that. Make sure it's lined up okay. Oh, it's not bad. And there I have just sort of tarted up my little book and I can tie it in place so it doesn't sort of ping out. This needs weighting down 
say under a heavy book or whatever you've got just till that glue dries and everything's in place and then we will have our lovely little book for our sample. So let's have a little look at our sample book and see what techniques are in here. Now the first one is the one that a lot of people love to use just salt sprinkled into a wash and I've done a whole film about that if you're interested. This was Epsom salts rather than table salt. It hasn't worked particularly well but um, that just goes to show that it is very colour dependent. The next few pages are all about plastic wrap and some of the alternatives to plastic wrap and again I did a whole film about that if you want to use plastic wrap or you want a slightly more ecological alternative. So that's a plastic bag which can be wiped and reused, that's wet pa baking paper, that's the inside of a cereal packet, I'll just come back to this one, and tin foil. So that was all covered before. This is a little sample of um, crackle paste with watercolour over the top which makes the most beautiful mosaic. I've done it on a little bit of mount board because it can sort of peel off a flexible support. So I've just popped those in there. Spattering is always great fun. And if you want bigger, more place dots, I actually use a syringe. And again, I've done a little bit of uh, a film before on that. And then colour sanding, which is a watercolour pencil, bit of sandpaper, and you sand off the dust into a damp area and you get these very, very fine now marks. this one is always fun. <clears throat> and it's quite bizarre. Maybe into something that you haven't thought about using. But let's put a, quite a dark wash so you can really see the effect. And it is to use dishwasher rinse aid stuff you put in your dishwasher so everything is all sparkly clean you get the same effect with alcohol um, or even something like strong perfume so I'm going to use a brush to put it on and I hope you can see that it starts to push this might be a little bit dry bother I'm going to redo one of the ones I did earlier because I don't, didn't think that it looked that great and that was the dishwasher rinse aid. I'd let the paint dry a little bit too much so let's do that and then pick up that rinse aid and hope, oh that's better, look can you see that wonderful explosion as it pushes the pigment away. If it's too wet you'll find that it whooshes back in afterwards so it is a case of getting it at just the right degree of wetness. But you can see that you get a pale shape in the middle and it pushes the paint away and it's fantastic to if oh if you're doing an underwater scene for plankton and things like that. And I don't think we should forget just good old water. We're using all this special stuff, but actually just dropping water into a drying wash, of course, creates beautiful water blooms. You've got to get the timing just right, but go back in and put a drop of water and it will start to push the pigment away and give you beautiful water blooms if that's what you want. Now something that is rather fun is to use bubble wrap and I've used bubble wrap on the background of this little buzzy buzzy bee to give the impression of the honeycomb because I didn't want to paint lots of little hexagons. So bubble wrap into a wash can be really pretty. Great for abstracts as well. So if we put our wash down 
and we've got a little bit of bubble wrap put it bubble side down press it into your wash and you might need to weight it down with something because it can sort of ping up a little bit and then what I wanted to show you was scratching in to a wet wash and if you scratch into that wash you can see that you get dark lines very fine dark lines so say you were doing leaves and wanting very fine veins on leaves or fine lines on petals actually scratching in with with just a sharp knife gently you will get very dark lines. And just before we move on from this one I've dried it thoroughly checking with the back of my hand that it's cool and just wanted to show you the opposite that if it's dry and you scratch into the surface of course you get back to the white of the paper which can be incredibly useful for you know regaining a little white highlight in an eye or scratching out a little bit of white on waves or things like that so scratching into wet paint will give you a dark mark but scratching into dry paint will give you a white that's one side of our lovely book so let's turn over and see what we've got on the other side you've probably come across this as an incredibly useful way of being able to create clouds in skies so just a little bit of scrunched up paper and you can lift out soft marks that are, are great for cloud shapes. You might not have done this one since you were at school I guess and it's using either a white candle or even a wax crayon and, and indeed it could be colored doesn't have to be white to make a resist on the paper so the wax goes down you can't see it but when you put your paint over the top the paint will not go onto the paper now at school you probably did it as magic writing and wrote rude things <laughs> um, or I did anyway uh, but in watercolour it can be really useful for keeping the highlights in sparkling water or creating textures on rocks anything like that so medical gauze sort of stuff that you use to bandage wounds is in fact very interesting in watercolour you need to peel off a thin layer rather than use it as a big bandy and then you can see it's a very loose weave that actually you can pull and manipulate to, to make it less regular so to use it let's grab some colors we'll put a bit down first let's find something a bit brighter and more interesting and then you place the gauze in it you can paint over the top as well and somewhat counterintuitively what happens is the little cotton fibers actually absorb the color and if you leave that in place it will form dark lines so just have a look in the center of this flower i put gauze in the center of the flower and you can see these dark lines which i wanted just to give some texture to to the middle there so it's a really interesting thing to use particularly in landscapes actually it's lovely for more abstract type landscapes the next one is probably fairly obvious and it's blowing and just getting a short sharp breath so my head's going to come in the way here there we go blowing short sharp breath is usually the best and you can actually get some really quite fine lines great for the ends of feathers can be fun for whiskers really and it's a, a far more random mark than you might get if you'd used a thin sort of rigger slightly more controlled after our blowing 
is using a straw. Say I actually wanted my paint to go in a particular direction, I could use a straw. And it just lets you direct that a little bit more. And I've seen some lovely paintings done of, say, blossom on twigs, where the twigs have been blown with a straw. And it's just, again, a slightly more random, more natural mark than if you had painted it with a brush. Our next one is stencil. And of course, you can use anything for a stencil. I've got this old sort of ooh, 1960s doily which I don't use for cakes, you'll be very pleased to know. You need fairly thick paint because if it's too runny, it will seep underneath. And a bit of a sort of stabbing mark. Say you're painting lace on a painting, you could actually stencil it in place or you just need a bit of a pattern. Okay, we're on to the last couple of pages. What I wanted to say is that we don't just have to use a brush for our mark making. Printing can be great, and that can be from literally finger printing. You know, you want some round dots, why not just use your finger? Or even something simple like a little piece of watercolor paper, dip it into your paint, and then you can print lines. You can use the backs of leaves. You can, oh, I, well, you can print with anything. Why not? And then I just wanted to remind you of the granulating properties of your watercolors. I've got a bit of Mars Black, which I know is a really granulating. Um, pigment and you can see how it is clumping already. Let's put a bit more over here. And it's clumping as it settles into the, the grooves of my paper and this could be a great way of introducing a bit of texture. I did a whole film all about granulation so if you like that effect just check that one out. As I've been making this book I suddenly thought of one I'd missed, which of course is sponging. If you use a natural sponge and you should dampen it first, then dip it in your paint. It's a great way of getting a really lovely random texture and sponges vary between how fine and how clumpy they are, but always vary it so that it looks really natural. And that can be great for plumage or for distant foliage or, well, coral, all sorts. And then rinse your sponge afterwards. Just because you can do them doesn't mean you should. So if you overuse any of these, it will become a cliche. And if you use all 20 plus tricks in the same painting, it'll be a mess. <laughs> so. Also, don't be surprised if the outcome depends on which paint, which colour you use and how much water's there. Some of them are quite variable. And the other thing is that sometimes people make out that these techniques are new and it's contemporary and gosh, look at us. Um, aren't we being sort of clever and original? Actually, every single technique that we're doing here has been used for at least the last 50 years. It's what you do with them that makes them wonderful.